we grow up in a society that's heavily gender biased. And so whatever you do, however you think, once in a while, or most of the time, you have to kind of check yourself, right? And so if, if I'm to think like my grandfather back in the village, may the Lord rest his soul in peace, on Chris's, uh, on Chris's uh, proverb, was it a proverb? Was it a, whatever it was, he says that a woman holds the knife from the, from the sharp end. And if I'm to think like my grandmother, oh no, my grandfather, I'm like, what's wrong with this woman? Does she know that the knife has, the, uh, has a handle? Where are the men in her life? Why will they teach her this? But these are a source of biases that we possess as people as a result of the societies we've grow, grown up in. And I bet someone maybe in the room must have thought of that and remembered not to say it. Either way, uh, I'd like to walk you through the work we did. And so part of the work uh, that Sylvia had already hinted onto was uh, looking at uh, legislations in Kenya. And uh, while Sally finished by appreciating the partners and all project, uh, everyone else who was included in the project, I'd like to start with that. Uh, we are really grateful to the, uh, to the collaborations by Global Health 5050 and the International Center for Research on Women uh, for their collaboration, enabling us to do this study both in Kenya and in India. But most importantly, we are grateful for the Gates Foundation, who without which we wouldn't have the funds to conduct this study. And so um, I'm going to talk about uh, working, in, working, with the, working in this space of uh, gender and equity. And as a man who is probably quite advantaged, it's quite, I don't want to say it's tricky. I want to talk about it as, a, as an eye-opening experience. That when, when, you are really, when you are really from that position of advantage, advantages that often you don't even recognize yourself, some things that seem really, uh, really obvious come to you. They hit you that, okay, okay, this is now an advantage. You start realizing that really this is an advantage for me. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take an example. Uh, if you have a male supervisor, as a woman, of course, you're working with a male supervisor, and you are in the heat of work, uh, you are at that point of your work where you people need to keep in touch and you're like, okay, I, I just need to get back to them, uh, to them about this one thing, right? Of course, work-life balance is there, but once in a while you'll want to send that text message or WhatsApp message at night. How easy do you find it as a woman with a male supervisor? How easy do you find it as a man with a male supervisor? How is it, is, is it for you as a, as a man with a female supervisor? Let's think about that. that. Chris, my words are over now. Uh, I, I'll, charge, I'll start charging you. <laughs> so let's think about that as, a, um, as we even think about uh, supporting systems and enabling women to uh, scale their careers. Okay, now, now you're good. Since taxation works, when I said I'm going to charge him, things got better. And so, yeah, um, uh, in order not to stand between, your, your, uh, between you and your break time, I'll just try and uh, be really quick. So I'm going to talk about legislations for advancing women leadership in the health sector in Kenya. And when we start these, we start from, we start from, we don't start, we, we do not start from, uh, a clear slate. At least there's already something. There's something that we already know. There are people who've done stuff before we did whatever we did. And so when we begin, there's quite a lot that we know. We know that law and life chances, that laws shape structures affecting people's life chances and workforce opportunities. We, al we also know that there is a correlation between legal equality for men and women. Uh, and these can either improve employment equity or it can hinder. 
we know that there's a complex relation, there's a connection between law and gender economic equality. And I know there's a group uh, in here who are working on something similar to that. We know that uh, in terms of legal pluralism, we know that multiple legal systems, uh, say customary law and religious law, sometimes override uh, equal uh, formal laws. And so while we might have these in our formal laws, there are, other, uh, there are other systems that might override them. We also know that there are, there are, there are legal measures such as equal uh, land rights uh, that positively impact women's economic opportunities and empowerment. Similarly, evidence already exists on workplace equality, that laws that focus on equal pay, maternity protection, and uh, that prohibit workplace harassment uh, and, and promote career equity for women uh, remain elusive. And I think uh, our colleague from the Office of the President had entered onto that, the work that uh, uh, the World Bank Group, Women, Business, and the Law Report have done. We also know that uh, from a feminist legal scholarship perspective, uh, there, are, there are evidence that's been highlighted on how unpaid domestic labor contributes to workplace inequality. Also, what Sally has presented on uh, hints onto this. And uh, this suggests that laws should address specific needs like flexible, flexible working hours and uh, support for child care, especially be because uh, in terms of how, the society, uh, how our society operates, this has heavily been relegated to this, uh, a woman's role. And then we also know that there's a fundamental role of the law, that the law is the foundation for building systems and structures of equality and enhancing accountability within and outside uh, the workplace. But even as we already know this, we can pick at least four key arguments that are made for supporting women leadership, supporting equity, supporting uh, gender equality. And the first one is uh, a right-based gender justice. And of course, men and women fundamentally are equal by all, all means, just by the virtue of being human beings. And I'm, I'm gonna jump to the last one also, that we know that uh, uh, the other argument is that as a country we have committed, and again, this has been hinted on, that we've committed to global commitments such as CEDO, and uh, that's why it is necessary. We also know, at least there is little evidence on uh, the impact of women leadership on health outcomes for women, children, and interestingly, also men. And lastly, and uh, I'm looking for uh, Pepala, Papela, I don't know where he is, and lastly, Papela tried to make this argument yesterday, the instrumentalist argument that as a businessman, what value does it bring to me to have uh, women in my leadership position? In fact, even within the institution, what value does it bring to me? And so you realize that the middle ones, the two, I bet that is yellow, right? The two yellow ones, I meant it to be yellow. So if it's not, just assume it's yellow, yeah? So the two middle ones, there is quite very little evidence, although there is evidence, not as much. And so if any, if any one of you wants to take up something to, uh, uh, to, to research about, I think it will, make really, it will be really useful for, for, um, for everyone that we generate more evidence on this. That notwithstanding, I like to reiterate that the work we, do, we did is heavily focused on the two green ones, right-based gender justice, but also on global commitments that as a country we've committed to. Now, um, we take this from a, uh, we take this, the broader perspective of this, and I know uh, Sally and Sylvia have also talked about, about this in one or, it's the same thing, but in really different ways. That if we look at, uh, uh, in general, if we want to target the broader perspective, is that we are targeting laws that are harmful to social norms. And uh, these are some things, uh, things related to non-discrimination, which our constitution is heavy about. We are talking about positive discrimination or affirmative action. We are talking about equ uh, equal responsibility. We are talking about transforming gender norms. 
But then addressing that is like the, the outer crust. And so there's quite, you could address that and still you'll have problems with mobility, entrepreneurship, and uh, asset, and then also marriage. And so there is one layer below that that's on laws that target structural, structural barriers. And yet another layer below that on laws targeting workplace barriers, and this is on pay, care work, work-life balance, pension, reproductive rights. And now to the objective of what we aim to achieve in this study, equal opportunity in the workplace, specifically uh, enabled by the law. Now, uh, Sylvia had already talked about this. So we had three key angles that we were looking at. And uh, if you remember Sylvia's cube, do you? Yeah, it had, uh, you know, a cube, it has height, it's breadth, width, height, right? Breadth is height. Length, width, breadth, I think. And so we are looking at comprehensiveness, that to what extent, how, how comprehensive are these uh, are Kenyan laws that affect workplace? Are there accountability mechanisms on these laws? And then are there equity and human rights uh, pronouncement on the laws that we looked, like, uh, we looked at? And we had adopted uh, the Women, Business, and the Law Report, the approach that they used to analyze laws across the globe, but then added a few more axes that were not uh, in that. And so for our study, we look at care, family life, and work-life balance. We look at laws that apply to, to that. We look at laws that affect reproductive rights. This was not part of the Women, Business, and the Law Report, but it's an addition to what we do. We look at workplace protection, we look at pay, we look at pension as, uh, as, as the key areas that we are looking at those laws. And so this one speaks to the comprehensiveness of, uh, of our laws. And uh, disclaimer, I'm going to talk more about the comprehensiveness than I'm going to talk about accountability and, uh, and, uh, accountability and equity and human rights. And so part of the findings uh, that Sylvia has already mentioned that uh, under comprehensiveness, we find that Kenyan laws contain 18 out of 30 good practice provisions for promoting women's entry and advancement in the workforce. We find performance is high in pay, workplace, and pension. Anyone wants to guess why? Atuoli, probably. Labor unions, right? And, and we have, we've had a strong one. So likely it affects men as it affects women. Uh, but our performance is poor in care, family life, work-life balance, and reproductive rights domain. On accountability, we find that roughly 6 in 10 of uh, Kenyan laws reviewed contain accountability measures for implementation uh, and or uh, monitoring. We find also that 4 out of 11 laws assign responsibility for implementation, but none have measures for monitoring implementation. We also find that none of the laws that we reviewed, okay, let me put it differently. We did not find any monitoring mechanisms in the laws that we reviewed. Uh, and uh, no, we found some, uh, but none of the monitoring mechanisms in the laws that we reviewed are independent from the government or committed to reporting non-compliance in the public domain. And uh, I do know, I, I know Papella has disappeared, is from KNSCR, uh, while they are government they try to be as independent as possible, and we do recognize that. And I bet if you go through um, the resources, you'll see the paper, and uh, it does recognize that. Um, also on equality, we find that very few Kenyan laws contain provisions to promote equality, non-discrimination, positive discrimination, or support for women's double burden of labor. This is generally the affirma affirmative action conversation. And uh, uh, for a good reason, uh, because it's already in the Constitution, uh, someone might make the argument that it's taken care of. But for a good reason also, it's important that we have it in uh, kind of specific laws. And then we also know that uh, one of the other things that we find that three out of the 11 laws that we looked at contained equality provisions, including non-discrimination. Three out of 11 uh, uh, contained the, uh, the, the equality provisions that we were looking at. And so let's do some um, kind of some reflection. I think one of the things we are, um, we are thinking of is that legal environments and structural conditions are crucial for promoting women's participation in the 
formal labor force and their advancement to leadership position. We do know this. We also know that uh, uh, equality of opportunity in the healthcare workforce requires key provisions to be codified in the law and accountability measures must be implemented to ensure their effective enforcement. Um, there's also uh, the point that comes out that in Kenya, legal barriers to women leadership have received very limited attention from the government and many good practice provisions that promote equal opportunities in employment are uh, absent. Uh, we, we see that the care, family life, and work-life balance domain have received particularly little legislative attention in Kenya. And uh, other low and middle income, uh, in Kenya and also other low and middle income countries, which definitely impedes women's entry into health sector occupation or even prevents them from uh, assuming leadership roles. And then we also know, uh, we see that lack of accountability measures raise concerns about the impact of legal provision on women and marginalized groups. And positive measures are needed to promote equality and address the double burden of labor. Uh, some of the recommendations that we make from uh, the findings uh, of this study is that legislations should, I was tempted to change that to must, but legislators should consider gender norms in law to ensure comprehensive support for women's careers. Uh, also, that while the Constitution provides for equity and discrimination measures, there is a need for individual legislations to also contain uh, equity provisions. There is a need for government to review legislative processes to ensure that uh, future laws can account for robust accountability mechanisms. And then uh, a key question for future research is uh, uh, really in identifying those factors that uh, have the potential to influence the development and adoption of legal instruments that promote gender equalities. Uh, the other recommendations that to make is that laws can sometimes lead to backlash. Thus, there is need for sensitization of, uh, of stakeholders. And then there is also need for greater advocacy by different stakeholder groups, including trade unions, corporate uh, uh, CSOs, international organizations, uh, in order to facilitate the development of gender progressive legal frameworks, which work as a positive determinant to women's career growth. I'd like to stop there. Uh, I bet when we go on to when we go on to the discussion, uh, the, there was a question asked yesterday about the specific laws. Uh, we can talk further about them, uh, and uh, just roughly, you see that we are doing well on workplace, really well on pay, uh, on pension. There is the law. There is the legal provision we are looking for, and then there is the answer at the end, whether it's a yes or no. So a Y definitely means yes, and an N means a no. And then there's the place where we are doing really badly under care work, uh, care and work-life balance. Uh, we are doing terribly. And then we have reproductive rights from the, uh, that we also adapted from the World Bank. We are also not doing really well. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs>